Now, we are absolutely delighted to have Lord Cullen with us today to give our keynote address, a man who really has changed the nature of how we work in the oil and gas industry. If it hadn't been for Lord Cullen's inquiry into the Piper Alpha disaster more than 25 years ago, perhaps the industry would never have been faced with its first tipping point. Lord Cullen's 106 recommendations into the safety management practices of the offshore operations have not only been used and implemented in the North Sea, but have caused ripples across the globe. Many workers are probably alive today because of Lord Cullen's inquiry, inquiry, a highly regarded judge with no previous exposure to the oil industry, but one who's managed to change its approach to safety and risk forever. Please welcome to the stage the Right Honourable Lord Cullen of Whitekirk. Very much excuse my old age but it's some 25 years since I was sitting in this building hearing evidence about the Piper Alpha disaster. This uh, conference is extremely important in its focus on human risk and it's a great privilege for me to give the opening address. I'll be giving my personal thoughts and comments but illustrating them by reference to a number of accidents in operations involving major hazards. First of all, I want to say something about what I will call the working environment. In safety investigations, it's important to undercover the underlying factors which played a part in what happened. The board which investigated the loss of the spaceship Columbia and its crew in 2003 made this remark, and I quote, when causal chains are limited technical flaws, and individual failures, they said, the ensuring responses aimed at preventing a similar event in the future are equally limited. They aim to fix the technical problem and replace or retrain the individual responsible. Such corrections lead to a misguided and potentially disastrous belief that the underlying problem has been solved. And that brings me to the working environment, by which I mean the whole setup in which operatives work. The physical design of the plant, the procedures, the standards, the practices for which they're expected to uh, comply, and so on. In the event of an accident, there may well be reasons for what otherwise could be written off as no more than the result of human error. The working environment, it seems to me, can have a considerable influence on whether operators make errors. I take two examples from the nuclear industry the Chernobyl disaster in the Ukraine in 1986 followed a runaway chain reaction and a large power surge. It illustrated the danger of designers leaving it to the operatives, whatever may have been their faults, to take corrective action rather than designing an inherently safe solution. And then the commission which investigated the incident at Three Mile Island nuclear plant in Pennsylvania seven years before found that the operating procedures which applied had been at least very confusing and could be read in such a way as to lead the operators to take the incorrect actions which they did. And then again, the Esso gas plant at Longford, Australia in 1998. There was a restarting of the pumping of warm lean oil to a heat exchanger, causing it to fracture releasing hydrocarbon vapors and liquids. The training of personnel had emphasized the knowledge they needed for their job, but not an understanding that the heat exchanger could not withstand low temperatures and thermal shocks. The investigating commission dismissed Esso's contention that the accident was simply caused by the fault of personnel. The fact that none of those on duty at the time understood just how dangerous it was, indicated a systematic training failure. Not even the plant manager understood the dangers of cold metal. Now these, and no doubt many other examples, demonstrate that the working environment may lead or lend itself to human error. It's of course up to management to see the working environment does not do so. Now, part of the working environment is the place given to safety, the culture. And there can be conflicts of priorities or inducements. At the 
oil storage depot at Brunsfield in England in 2005, a sticking gauge and an inoperable high-level switch led to an overflow of petrol, the ignition of a vapor cloud, and a massive explosion and fire. The official investigation found that the control room staff had limited control over flow rates and timing of incoming fuel and did not have a sufficient understanding in order to manage its storage. Increasing throughput and a lack of engineering support put more pressure on the site management and staff. These pressures created a culture where keeping the process operating was the primary focus and process safety did not get the attention, resources, or priority which it required. Keeping the process operating was the primary focus. Employees can be distracted by getting mixed messages from the management about safety. A member of the board which investigated the Columbia disaster in 2003 later wrote, and I quote, Leaders must remember that what they emphasize can change an organization's stated goals and objectives. If reliability and safety are preached as organizational bumper stickers, but leaders constantly emphasize keeping on schedule and saving money, workers will soon realize what is deemed important and change accordingly." Unquote. As, was, uh, as regards the risk of a conflict over priorities, in my report on Piper Alpha, I said this, senior management must demonstrate to their organization that safety is of the highest priority and that improvements in safety will, in addition to reducing injuries and incidents, result in improved business. The noise around performance must be tempered to ensure it does not swamp the noise around safety. And that means that through, throughout the organization, there has to be effective leadership in safety, and leaders must make their commitment to safety visible through their active involvement. The implications of human behavior and attitudes are particularly significant offshore, where safety depends on the interaction of people who may, may come from different disciplines and different employment, and that puts a premium on sound collaboration and effective communications. Now, so far I've been talking about the influence of the working environment. If I turn secondly to look at the influence of human error, it seems to me that it's for management to see that the working environment is robust enough to allow for the fact that operatives are only human with all the normal weaknesses, tendencies, and limitations. Operatives can be absent-minded, distracted, preoccupied, careless, or poorly motivated. They can forget to take precautions even when they've been fully trained and know the dangers. I take a very simple example from a very different field, the railway accident at Clapham Junction in 1988. The accident happened after the signaling system showed a false signal. A technician had failed to insulate a redundant wire. He was conscientious and he blamed himself for what happened but wrongly. He knew what to do and wrongly thought he had done it properly. The author of the report said this, any worker will make mistakes during his working life, no matter how conscientious he is in preparing and carrying out his work. There will come a time when he makes a slip. It is those unusual and infrequent events that have to be guarded against by a system of independent checking of his work. Human, human factors can affect working practices. The Piper Alpha disaster was preceded by a number of shortcomings in the way in which the permit to work procedure was carried out. Looking to the future, I said, over time, there is an increasing probability that procedures in practice will have departed from that originally laid down. 
Hence, I said, management should pick up these changes in a timely way and decide what to do, such as modifying the system or providing additional training and so on. But not everything can be covered in advance by procedures or training or picked up in due course by monitoring or auditing. I thought that frontline supervisors could certainly play an important part in keeping an eye on what is happening and using their considerable hands-on experience on the spot, for example, where there are unforeseen situations. Thirdly, I would say something about a commitment to safety. And here again, I think supervisors can form an important bridge between management and the workforce. In my report on Piper Alpha, I said, it's essential that the whole workforce is committed to and involved in safe operations. The frontline supervisors are a key link in achieving that as each is personally responsible for ensuring that all employees, whether the company's own or contractors, are trained to do work safely and that they not only know how to perform their job safely, but are convinced that they have a responsibility to do so. Now, bringing home commitment to safety means not only creating motivation for good safety practices, but also putting resources into the management of safety for that purpose. Safety awareness in the whole workforce is sometimes referred to as making them error wise so they can identify dangers and act accordingly. That calls for vigilance, and that's where personal qualities matter. An incident, a near miss, an abnormality in the functioning of plant, a failure in communication, any of these could be a precursor to serious trouble. Safety awareness at all level all levels should avoid any tendency to tolerate, cut corners, or forget, or indeed a tendency to fail to report, investigate, and take corrective action. That assumes, of course, a general commitment to safety which enables employees to report what has happened without fear of recrimination. So how do we counter fear of reporting? a fear of reluctance to step forward and to voice concern? How do we cultivate a collaborative attitude to risk? Ultimately, it seems to me, the multiple barriers to prevent catastrophe include risk awareness, vigilance, and a real freedom to speak out. I look forward to this conference providing insights as to how better account can be taken of human risk in all aspects of offshore operations. I wish you all well in that endeavor. Thank you.